Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Awake. Welcome to the Gospel of John. We're going to get started with a, uh, a word of prayer here this evening. And uh, then we've, we've got some really exciting material to cover together, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, let, let's just begin by coming before the Lord, shall we? Father, we, uh, we are in absolute awe and wonder before you. We rejoice because you are a God who does mighty things. We declare what the scriptures say, that you are the living God, that you do not change. We thank you for the way you've broken into our world. We thank you for the way you continue to break into our lives. And we pray that this evening, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would speak into each one of our hearts and each one of our lives. Draw us to Jesus, our Savior. Give us wisdom from above, understanding of your desire for our lives. May we, Lord, be wholly dedicated to you. We also pray, Father, that you would break into the lives of people throughout this land and around the world. In this month of Ramadan, we pray especially for the Islamic world, praying, Father, that during this time of fasting and prayer, you would continue to reveal yourself to many Muslim people. We thank you, Lord, for the incredible things that you have been doing, and we pray for a continued move of your Holy Spirit leading Muslim people to come to know Isa al Masi, Jesus the Messiah. We thank you, God, for your love, your mercy, and your goodness, and we pray that this evening you would reveal yourself in power to each and every one of, it, uh, of us. We pray it in Jesus' strong name. Amen. What I'd like to do tonight is uh, begin where we had left off last time. We had... Uh, finished going through chapter one of the Gospel of John, and if you would uh, take out your Bibles this evening, uh, turn to John chapter two, beginning at verse one, as the, uh, the account continues. And uh, after Jesus had called some initial disciples, uh, we pick up now at chapter two, and this is what we read. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Uh, we're, we're actually going to camp on this for a little bit because there are a number of fascinating things here that often get overlooked and yet really are quite significant and, and speak very powerfully to our understanding of this gospel. As we've said all along, the gospel of John is a truly Jewish gospel. And uh, it is something that many believers have only realized recently as a result of work done in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the fact of the matter is, this is a, a gospel written by an individual who is a devout Jew, who knew Jesus as best friend, and, and who understands that Jesus has come to fulfill everything the Hebrew prophets have spoken of. Chapter 2 begins by saying, on the third day, a wedding took place. And, and very often, people People look at that and say, well, okay, uh, John the Baptist on one day had said, there's the Lamb of God, and two of his followers went with Jesus, and then on the next day, Jesus was introduced to, to two others, and uh, then the, the natural reaction is to say, so on the third day, he now goes to a wedding. But keep in mind, they were way down in Judea along the Jordan River, and now they have gone all the way up into Galilee. In all likelihood, what this means is on the third day of the week. One of the things that we know is that throughout the centuries, Orthodox Jewish people have tended to get married on Tuesdays, the third day of their week. Keep in mind the first day of the week is the day we call Sunday. Monday is the second, Tuesday is the third. And if you ask the question, well, why would they get married on a Tuesday? Uh, the answer is Genesis chapter 1 and the creation of the world. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And keep in mind, that's the way the Gospel of John begins, in the beginning. <laughs> uh, but if you read the account of the creation, one thing that especially struck the rabbis is in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 12. And uh, if you hang on to John 2 and turn back to Genesis 1, this is what we read. Genesis 1, verse 10 says, God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. 
And then verse 12, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. This is the first time in the book of Genesis that on a single day, God declares things to be good, not once, but twice. And as a result, the rabbis looked at that and they said, boy, the third day is an especially good day. What a great day to get married. As a result, for centuries now, Orthodox Jewish people have set their wedding dates on Tuesdays. And, and that goes all the way back into biblical times. And most likely, that's what's going on here. It's on the third day. On, on the third day of the week, on a Tuesday, there was a wedding held up north at Cana in Galilee. And then it goes on to say this. Jesus' mother was there. Uh, individuals over the centuries have noted that Mary plays a very prominent role at this wedding. And that is what has led some to suggest that this is the wedding of someone who is closely related to Mary. And the suggestion that has frequently been made is, it's none other than John, the son of Zebedee. If you read carefully through the Gospels, it appears that Mary's sister, who is mentioned in, in the scripture, it appears that Mary's sister is none other than the mother of James and John. And so some have suggested this may actually have been the author's wedding. Uh, again, there is nothing in here that says that, but it is something that people have speculated on. One thing we know for sure, Mary plays a significant role in the events that take place on this day. But there's something else that's worth noting here, and it's mentioned in passing, but I believe it's highly significant. It says Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And uh, I'd love that. Jesus also had been invited to the wedding. If you want to know the secret to a truly God-pleasing, joy-filled, successful marriage, it needs to start with Jesus being an invited guest all the time. And his presence at this wedding, it, it, it's fascinating. When you compare the description of this wedding with the description that's often given in newspapers or in, uh, on Facebook when people talk about their weddings, you know, what will happen? They'll tell you what the bride wore and, and uh, what the color scheme was and what was served at the, the wedding banquet and so on and so forth. In this one, we don't know the names of the bride and groom. We don't know what food was served. We don't know anything that you would usually hear about in a description of the wedding. But one thing we do know, Jesus was invited to it. And because he was there, everything changed. And uh, that continues to be true today. When Jesus is invited into your wedding, into your marriage, it makes a huge difference. I'd encourage you, if you haven't invited him yet, to do so because he truly does change lives and change marriages. Well, verse, two, verse three, rather, it says, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Uh, again, knowing what we know about Jewish weddings throughout the ages, uh, we know, first of all, that they tend to last a long time. In, in ancient times, it was common for a wedding to go on for a week. The, the wedding banquet lasted a week, sometimes even longer. And uh, all the family, the village would be gathered there, friends and others, and, and they would simply celebrate. And a bride and groom were treated like a king and queen. On, on the, at the, the wedding feast. It, it was a time of just wonderful celebrating. Something that would ruin everything is if you run out of refreshments. And that's what happens here. Uh, our, our natural reaction is to think, well, this is all happening on the third day. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, I think you can make a very strong case that the wedding feast has probably been going on for a few days and all of a sudden Mary, who is somehow given responsibility for knowing what's happening, realizes they are out of wine. 
th this is going to be a disaster. Uh, you know, everybody's going to be talking about this for years. This couple, they ran out of wine at the wedding festival and everyone is scandalized by it. And so Mary goes to Jesus and says, hey, here's what's going on. And his response often shocks us. Woman, why do you involve me? Woman. Uh, to us, that sounds, well, it, it sounds brusque, uh, arrogant, unconsiderate. Uh, in reality, in biblical times, this language is none of those things. Uh, if we were to translate this, per perhaps something that would get us a little bit closer would be something like ma'am or madam. Uh, but but the words are actually far more tender than that. And you can tell that elsewhere in the Gospel of John. Jesus will call his mother woman on another occasion. And it's on the cross. And he will say, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. As he entrusts Mary to his best friend, John. Uh, th this is not a term of derision here. This is not Jesus being uh, naughty. Instead, this is a very respectful term, even though to Western ears it doesn't sound that way. And Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. It's fascinating, Mary's response. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. By the way, I will just say this. That is great advice, not just for servants at a wedding. That is a wonderful word for you and me. Do whatever he tells you. When Jesus says something, we ought to listen. When the Lord speaks, we ought to not only hear, but obey. And uh, again, those words can be easily read over, but they have profound significance for us. But they also lead us to an issue. And I don't want to ignore this. It's sort of like the elephant in the room. And the issue is simply, isn't this a rather frivolous miracle? The normal reaction of a Western believer is to look at this and say, why would Jesus, for his first miracle, make somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 gallons of wine? Um, the the answer is sometimes given, well, he wants to show that marriage is important. And, and don't get me wrong, marriage is important. It, it is what God himself instituted at the very beginning. He made us male and female. God is the one who says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. God is into marriage. But this is far more than just a frivolous miracle or Jesus saying, well, I'm going to do this so that people will know I like marriage. Instead, we need to look at this in light of what the Hebrew scriptures say, what the Old Testament tells us, what the Jewish people believed and continue to believe. Uh, keep in mind, in, in Jewish culture and in the language of the, the Hebrew scriptures, God speaks of himself as being married to his people. And God calls himself the groom, in effect, uh, of his people. And he gives himself for his bride, the, the children of Israel. Classic example of that, Isaiah chapter 62, verse, verse 5. If you uh, hang on again to John chapter 2 and turn back into the Hebrew Scriptures, Isaiah 62, verse 5 reads as follows. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Numerous places in the Old Testament, God speaks of his people as being an unfaithful bride. And, and the prophets frequently talk about how the, the children of Israel have committed, in effect, spiritual adultery by worshiping other gods. God calls himself the groom. Isn't it fascinating that one of Jesus' favorite terms for himself is the bridegroom? And in his teachings, in his parables, he, what does he do? He compares the, uh, the final fulfillment of the ages when the Messiah returns. He compares it to what? A wedding feast. 
And that too is in keeping with what the Hebrew scriptures say and what the rabbis believed and what the rabbis taught. Once again, from the words of the prophet, actually the words of God from the prophet Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 25, verses six to nine, here is the Lord speaking about what it's going to be like when the messianic age arrives, when, when Messiah rules over all the earth. And uh, it reads as follows, beginning at verse 6 in Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove from his people's, he will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And the rabbis looked at that and said, that's what it's going to be like when Messiah comes. It is going to be a wedding feast. It will be a time of celebration, the best of foods and the best of wines. And Jesus continues that kind of teaching. He says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be a wedding feast. We are going to celebrate, if I may put it this way, we are going to party in the best sense of the word. And now Jesus performs his first miracle. Where? At a wedding. For Jewish people, this would have been a picture that would forever remain in their minds because Jesus does the very thing that they believed Messiah was going to do. He was going to provide the best of wines. It was going to be a great feast. It is not a frivolous miracle. It is Jesus saying, in effect, here's who I am. I am the bridegroom. I am the one who provides everything you need. I am the one who brings in the wedding feast. It, it's really an incredibly powerful miracle. And it's only Western eyes that see this and say, well, why is he making all that wine? Uh, for, for devout Jewish people, this is, this is the Messiah. And uh, so John continues with his, uh, his description here, and he says the following. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Question for you. Why does John mention they were stone water jars? And is that significant? And the answer is yes. They are stone water jars, the kind set aside especially for ritual washings, for purifying people who worship the living God. Why stone and not pottery? And there, the answer is given in the book of Leviticus. If something unclean comes into a pottery vessel, you're supposed to break it. On the other hand, if it's stone, you can simply clean it out. And uh, we know, it, we've actually found a number of these large stone water jars used for, for purification rites. They, as they are studied by archaeologists, what we've learned is they are made out of a single block of limestone turned on a lathe and, and reamed out so that they are permanent. And they are only used for one thing, and that is water for purifying people. Water for saying to individuals, now you can approach a holy God. And Jesus sees those stone water jars there, and here is what he does. He says, he said to them, verse, uh, verse 8, or verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Some people have suggested over the years, maybe Jesus just had them put water into something that used to contain wine and the water sitting in the container that used to contain wine took on the flavor of wine and, and they fooled everybody with it. No, these are stone jars that are only used for water. 
Jesus says, fill them up. And please note, there are six of them, each of them holding 20 to 30 gallons. So we'll split the difference and say 150 gallons. Now, this is not a small amount of wine. And uh, John says, they did what Jesus told them to do. And the master of the banquet, verse 9, tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. In other words, this is good stuff. In effect, what the master of ceremonies, the individual who is the master of the banquet, what he's saying is, hey, usually, you know, you bring out the nice stuff first and then you bring out the Boone's Farm when everybody's had plenty to drink. Instead, he says, you've brought out fine California wine here. You know, uh, th this, is, this is really good stuff. And uh, what Jesus is showing here is not just that he has supernatural power. What he's demonstrating is he is the Messiah. He is the very one that has been predicted by the Hebrew prophets for centuries. This is not a frivolous miracle. This is a dramatic declaration of Jesus' identity and purpose. And it is something that is backed up by everything else we hear in Jesus' teaching in the months that follow. Because he will persistently refer to himself as the bridegroom, the very term that is used of God himself. And, and he refers to his people as being those who are invited to the wedding feast and get to celebrate. That's what Messiah does. This is dramatic. It really is. And, and so John wraps it up by saying the following. It says, verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Uh, this is the, uh, the first use of a very important word in the Gospel of John. And the word is simply signs. This is the first of the signs that Jesus performed. In the Gospel of John, there are seven miracles that are mentioned and, and uh, given considerable attention. Uh, the first is this one, at the wedding of Cana, as water is turned into wine. Uh, in John chapter 4, we read about Jesus healing the royal official's son. John 5, we have the account of the, the lame man at Bethesda, whom Jesus heals and the man is able to walk about. In John 6, the feeding of the 5,000. Later in that chapter, Jesus walking on water in the Sea of Galilee. Then in John chapter 9, the healing of the blind man. And then finally in John 11, the raising of Lazarus. Now John is very quick to point out as we read toward the end of the gospel, Jesus did many other things that are not recorded in this book. If every one of them were written down, I suppose the entire world would not be able to hold all of the books that would be written. But John the evangelist has chosen seven specific miracles that he highlights showing Jesus identity, demonstrating that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He uses a word, however, that is only used to describe miracles in this gospel. The, the Greek word is semeon. It's uh, over there on the left-hand side of the screen near the top. Semeon. Uh, that word is used by the other evangelists, but it's not used to describe miracles. Instead, it is used in this sense. Jesus' enemies will say, what sign will you give us to prove that you know, what you are saying is true? And Jesus will respond, uh, the only sign you're going to receive is the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the, the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth. But in John, the word semeon, or sign, is often used to refer to a miracle. And uh, unlike the other Gospels, John does not use the normal word for miracle. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the usual word for miracle is the Greek word dynamis, which is uh, at the bottom there of the left-hand side of the screen. John instead uses this word semeon, and the emphasis is these actions that Jesus takes, these actions 
are clear signs that he is who he claims to be. That word will come up over and again throughout this gospel. And it, it's worth noting it, and we will point it out in a number of places where it really is quite significant. But here we're told this is the first of the signs that Jesus performed and that his disciples believed in him. When Jesus acts, he acts so that we will believe. These things are written, John writes toward the end of the gospel, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are powerful signs that testify to him. And, and uh, it, it's especially significant then that this first miracle of a wedding is a reminder. He is the bridegroom. And do you realize how dramatic that is? Throughout this gospel and throughout the New Testament, titles that are applied to the living God are applied to Jesus. And it's just as the gospel begins. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is enabling us to see Jesus' identity as the Savior, the Messiah, but also a real human being who is also truly God. Let's continue then. Verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. They went down to Capernaum. Why would we say that? Well, the answer is because Galilee is, or because Cana is up in the Galilean hills. And uh, the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum are actually below sea level. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is the lowest body of fresh water on the face of the planet. And uh, Jesus will put his headquarters down near the Sea of Galilee on the northern shore at, uh, in the town of Capernaum. Here is a picture taken from the hills, uh, the Galilean hills on the, uh, this is taken from the west looking east. Uh, at the southern end of the Sea of Galilee, in the back you see the Golan Heights. The Sea of Galilee is about 700 feet below sea level, and Jesus' headquarters, the headquarters of Jesus, Inc., will be uh, located on the northern shore of that, that Sea of Galilee in the town of Capernaum in the home of Simon Peter. Uh, what is so fascinating about that, and is so fascinating about much that is recorded here in the Gospel of John, is that within the last 50 years or so, we have unearthed things that have been buried for centuries that enable us to actually be in the very sites and, and see the, 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 the effects of many of the characters here in the Gospel of John and in the Gospels. Uh, for example, work that was done in the, uh, the 1960s and uh, early 70s in, uh, in Capernaum. Uh, archaeologists working in the site of an ancient church that was reputed by, by people generations earlier to have been built on the site of Peter's house. Archaeologists dug down and they discovered another church below the existing ancient church. Below that, they discovered a first century home. And through excavation, they were able to determine it is apparently the home of fishermen. They actually found 2,000 year old fish hooks in some of the outbuildings of this, uh, the, this household. And uh, as they did further work and as they have excavated much of ancient Capernaum that goes all the way back to the first century, the time of Jesus, they found that all of the homes were pretty much the same with one exception. And it was that home. That home, unlike the others, they were all built out of black basalt but that home somewhere in the middle of the first century was plastered, both the floors and the walls. And its, its usage was changed from being just an, a normal dwelling place to a gathering place. They also were able to remove layers of plaster from the walls and discovered ancient graffiti in that plaster, saying things like this, Jesus is the Lord. Praise the Messiah, Jesus our Savior. The, the prevailing evidence is this really is Peter's home. And today there is a new church. It was built in 1991, as I recall, built over that, 
those two ancient churches and over that first century home. It is a unique construction. It, it almost looks like a flying saucer that is resting on four large pillars. If you go in, and, and over the years, the first few times uh, Jan and I had gone to Israel, we weren't able to get into that church. But the last few times we've been there, we've been able to go right in. And, and it is an amazing thing to behold because when you walk into that church, you find that in the center, it is wide open with a glass floor. There's a railing around it. And you can go up to the railing and you look down into the first century house. And uh, it appears to be the home of Simon Peter. It's where Jesus went after staying at the wedding. He and others go to Capernaum for a few days. And it's there that Jesus will have his headquarters. By the way, in all of Israel, this is about the only place that still looks the way it did in Jesus' day. There has been very little major construction around. You don't have high rises. Uh, there, there are homes and, and there are, are you know, many buildings and, and villages, but it, it still has the look that it would have had in Jesus' day. And uh, it, it, is, it is an amazing place to behold. It is also quite lush. It gets dried out in the summertime but it is a very lush area and has been kind of the breadbasket of Israel for many, many, many centuries, really. Let's continue then. Verse uh, 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip of cords, and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, this raises a very fascinating question and a, a very important issue. And the issue revolves around, when did this happen? Uh, this is Jesus cleansing the temple. And as many students of scripture have observed and noted, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all place the cleansing of the temple during the final week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion and his resurrection. John, however, places it early in Jesus' ministry. There have been a number of ways people have, have dealt with that. Some have said, well, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. That's one way. I don't buy into that at all. I, I believe the scriptures are God-breathed. I believe they are trustworthy and true. But that's what some have said. Somebody got it wrong. Second view well, John just puts this early to make a point, and he's not putting it in chronological order. And, and that is a view that is widely held. I believe the third option is a far better option and a far, far more defensible understanding. And, and here is why. The third option is this. There were two cleansings, one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the other at the end of his ministry. And it also helps explain some things that we see elsewhere then in the scriptures. Because you see, if you just read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in all three of those gospels, there is only one Passover mentioned. And that is the final Passover at the time of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. If you simply went with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would assume that the ministry of Jesus lasted no more than a year. John, on the other hand, mentions at least three Passovers, and we're going to look at that in a little while. Some have suggested he may even mention four. It is John who enables us to understand that the ministry of Jesus lasted longer than a year, and, and appears to have been something in the neighborhood of, of two to three and a half years. In addition, it explains an anomaly that we see in Matthew and Mark. In the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, both of those authors record that when Jesus is brought up on charges before the Sanhedrin, 
on, on the day that, that we call Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, you know, the night of what we would call Thursday night, what the Jews would call Thursday, Friday morning. But when Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin, there are many people who are brought in to bring charges against him. Matthew and Mark tell us that their charges just didn't carry weight because they couldn't agree on what they were saying. But one of the things that they say is, this man said, destroy this temple made with human hands and I will be rebuild another without human hands. And nowhere in Matthew, Mark, or Luke is anything like that mentioned. When Jesus is described as cleansing the temple in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he does not say anything like that. He only says it here in the Gospel of John. And in all likelihood, what is happening is people are remembering something he said at the beginning of his ministry, but they're not getting the exact quote, and it's all messed up. And as a result, their charges don't work together. And that seems to be what Mark especially is telling us here. And so it really does fit with the, the notion that this is a separate cleansing. And if you think about it, it really does make dramatic sense. Jesus begins his ministry doing what the Messiah was supposed to do, and that is to call God's people back to genuine faith, back to the living God, to restore the purity of the people of Israel and to call all nations to God. Jesus begins his ministry cleansing the temple. He ends his ministry cleansing the temple. And some of the things that we have learned, they are circumstantial at present. But there is circumstantial evidence to uh, suggest the following. It appears from the writings of the rabbis that usually the animals that were offered for sale for temple sacrifice and the cha money changing tables that uh, provided the opportunity for people coming from all over the world to exchange their currency for acceptable currency. It appears from the writings of the rabbis that those tables and stalls were originally located on the Mount of Olives, which would be to the east of the temple. However, there, is, there are some references that suggest at one point in time, because there were all sorts of issues with the family that was controlling the sale of the, the animals and controlling the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, exchange of currency, there, there were some, uh, some issues that arose. And as a result, it appears that those stalls and the money changer tables got moved from their original site on the, the Mount of Olives. Guess where they got moved? To the temple courts. Guess when? Somewhere in the neighborhood of around 30 AD. <laughs> Again, it, we don't have solid evidence yet, but there is circumstantial evidence to suggest that, and it fits exactly with what we see here. As Jesus comes into the temple and he sees, uh, keep in mind, the word that is used for temple here in John chapter 2, verse 14, where it says, in the temple courts, that's the way the NIV translates it. The, the word that is used in the Greek text of the Gospel of John is a single word. And the word is hieron. It refers, it is a word that refers to the outer courts of the temple, all of the buildings that surround it. It is sometimes used as the term for the entire structure. But it is a word that is used almost always, except for three verses in the Gospel of John. And those three verses are also here in chapter 2, and we're going to see them in a moment. But what John tells us is Jesus went into the here on. It's translated here, temple courts. And so it refers to these areas right here, what's often called the court of the Gentiles, where Jewish people and non-Jewish people alike can come and worship and pray.
It is supposed to be a house of prayer. That's what the, the, the Hebrew scriptures say. It's what the prophet Jeremiah said. This is a house of prayer. And instead, Jesus comes in and it is cluttered. It's cluttered with a rummage sale, in effect, with a bake sale in, in the very place where people are supposed to be worshiping and God is to be praised. You've got individuals selling sacrificial animals and changing currency. And Jesus is livid with rage. His disciples will later remember what the scriptures had said in the book of Psalms, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus makes a whip of cords, and it's only described here in John that way. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they don't talk about him using a whip of cords. But here in this first cleansing, he does. And he goes through turning over tables and dumping cages, and uh, he cleanses the place. Get these out of here, he says. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Uh, one other thing we know, and uh, that is in the temple, if you wanted to, uh, to pay your dues in effect, keep in mind every Jewish male was expected to pay a half shekel every year to support the temple. And it was called the temple tax. Jesus was once uh, confronted by his opponents who had turned to Simon Peter and said, does your teacher pay the temple tax? And what does Jesus do? He tells Peter, tell you what, throw a hook in, in the, uh, throw out your, uh, your line in the, the Sea of Galilee. First fish you catch, open its mouth, and, and you're going to find enough money to pay your temple tax and mine. To pay the temple tax, you were not allowed to use other foreign currency. Roman currency was notorious for being uh, uh, basically, uh, <laughs> The, the subject of inflation, one way you, you kept things going is you put less and less silver content in it. Consequently, at the temple, only one kind of currency was allowed, and that was what was known as a Tyrian stator. Uh, this is a, a coin that was minted in the city of Tyre on the, uh, the eastern shore of the uh, Mediterranean Sea, north of Galilee. Only this coin could be used there. And so the people operating the, uh, the uh, tables where you could change in your foreign currency for something you could use to pay your temple tax, uh, they would charge interest. We actually know what the interest was, 12.5%. This was a money-making operation. You know, it really was. And so Jesus goes in here and he sees these uh, money changers. He sees people selling the various sacrificial animals, and they're doing it where everybody is supposed to be worshiping. And he just turns over the tables. And at that point, as you can well imagine, um, it created a little bit of controversy. <laughs> and so this is what we read. Verse uh, 18, the Jews, and keep in mind, when John uses that word, John is Jewish, Jesus is Jewish, the disciples are Jewish. This is referring, in this case, to the Jewish leaders who are here in the temple. The Jews then responded to him, what sign, there's that word again, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And here it's necessary for us to look again at this diagram. Keep in mind, the Greek word for temple courts or the temple buildings is here on. But here, Jesus uses a different word. He uses the word naos. And naos refers to the sanctuary. In uh, Jesus' day, from the writings of Josephus and the writings of the rabbis, Here's what we know about the sanctuary. The sanctuary was made of white limestone. It was covered with gold. In fact, at the top of the sanctuary, the rabbis tell us, there were gold, you can see them right here, golden spikes placed at the top of the sanctuary so that birds would not sit up there. Because you know what birds do when they sit? They do. Yeah, 
They do do, I guess I should say. And, and so he wanted to keep birds off the sanctuary, and so these golden spikes were placed up there. The sanctuary itself, according to the, the writings of Josephus and the rabbis, stood 150 feet high. This is a huge building. It was not just beautifully constructed, it was amazingly decorated. According to the rabbis on the, the front of the temple, when you went up into the porch, and only priests were allowed to go in there, but when you went into the porch, there was this massive golden grapevine. The grapevine made out of solid gold covered the front of the temple. Attached to it were great big golden clusters of grapes. Those gold grape clusters stood six feet tall. In addition to that, numerous precious stones were mounted on it because devout Jewish people from all over the world would give special offerings so that their stones and gold could adorn the temple. According to first century eyewitnesses, when the sun rose over the, uh, the Mount of Olives, and this photograph is a, of a model, but you are looking toward the west. So when the sun rises toward the east, when the sun rises toward the east, according to first century eyewitnesses, the, the light of the sun sh reflecting off the white limestone and the gold decorations was so bright that people had to turn their eyes away. It was a majestic building. One early author said, if you have never seen the temple at Jerusalem, you have never seen a truly beautiful building. Naos refers to that sanctuary, 150 feet high, 150 feet deep. And in that sanctuary, you first of all have a porch, then you have two thirds of it made up of what was called the holy place. The holy place was a place only the priests could go. And they would go there to offer up incense and prayer. A priest had the opportunity once in his lifetime to go into the holy place. And that's where Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, went when he saw the angel Gabriel. He is going in for the first time in his life to offer up prayers and incense, and he encounters an angel. That's the holy place. Beyond it, in the last third, is the holy of holies. And it's there that God dwells. The Jewish people knew that at the tabernacle, God himself said he would dwell in the midst of his people. And the rabbis believed that it was in the Holy of Holies that in a very special way, the living God was physically, or I should say, fully present. Jesus uses this word, naos. And uh, as a result, what we have, Jesus responds to them, what sign will you give us? And he says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, literally destroy this sanctuary, and I will raise it again in three days. He is making an audacious claim. He is claiming to be the very one who brings God's presence to earth. In him, the fullness of the deity dwelt in bodily form, to quote the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians. That's what's going on here. And it is only here and in verse 20 and in verse 21 that the word naos is used in the Gospel of John. Every other time it's here or on, the temple courts or the temple in general. But here it's the sanctuary. And Jesus is saying, destroy this sanctuary and I will raise it again in three days. That's quite a sign. <laughs> then they reply, verse 20, they replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. This again is an incredibly important verse and one that has additional, additional information contained therein. Uh, they reply, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and they use the word naos, this sanctuary, and you're going to raise it in three days. Another way of translating this is 
This temple was built 46 years ago. Personally, I lean toward that alternative translation. The, the Greek text is difficult. There is no denying that. But this second translation, alternative translation, makes a lot of sense chronologically with what we also know from the rest of the New Testament. You know, there is one other instance in the Gospels where we are given a clear indicator of a point in time in Roman history when an event takes place. And that is in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, this is what we read in Luke 3, 1. Luke is a, a very careful historian. And he says the following, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So John the Baptist is described as beginning his ministry in the 15th year, the 15th year uh, of the, the Roman emperor here, as, uh, as Luke describes it in, in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Um, our best understanding of the way the Romans calculated reign and the way they dated their emperors would suggest that the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was somewhere in the neighborhood of 28, 29 AD. And that means that John the Baptist begins his ministry somewhere around 28, 29. 46 years after the sanctuary was built, what we know is building the entire temple complex took decades. Do you know that the temple complex in Jerusalem was actually not completed until the early 60s of the first century? It was completed just a few years before the Romans destroyed it in the year 70 AD. But the sanctuary, according to the records that we have, the sanctuary was completed in a year. And, and it was completed sometime around the year 18 BC. 46 years from there, 1718 BC, takes us to the year 30 AD. And uh, that fits with the other data that we have both in the New Testament and in the writings of ancient authors who say things that enable us to, to kind of date the events of the New Testament. The prevailing, the, the view that is becoming more and more the prevailing view today is that Jesus was crucified in the year 33 AD. Uh, that does work, by the way, with what we know now from the work that computers enable us to do with astronomy. We are able to, to calculate when did Passover occur in given years, and uh, what year was it when the Passover was celebrated in what we would call Thursday evening and continue over into Friday with the... Uh, with the, the feast of first fruits occurring on a Sunday, because Jesus rose on first fruits, the first day of the week, the day after the, uh, the Sabbath of Passover. Uh, in the year 33 AD, the first day of the week the, was indeed the, the day of first fruits, and that would have been fitting in with when Jesus rose from the grave. Anyway, it, it's, a, you know, it's a picky kind of thing. But it is fascinating if you're into chronology, and that is something that's always interested me, uh, it, it may help us to better date these things. And, and I do believe that the, the latter is, is probably a better translation of the Greek text, although I understand why the translators often go the other way. If you're fascinated by this kind of stuff, the best thing I know on the subject when it comes to the chronology of the New Testament and of the entire Bible is a, a book, uh, it is a classic written by Jack Finnegan entitled Handbook of Biblical Chronology. Uh, it is still available. It, it was originally written a number of years ago, updated and revised in the late 1990s. Finnegan died around the year 2000, but it remains the best thing out there for if you really, I, I mean, it's a huge volume. It's available still in paperback for uh, like 20 some odd dollars on Amazon. Uh, you can still find hard copies 
and, and I have one of those, but they're actually pretty, pretty valuable. Uh, you know, anywhere from 50 to a few hundred dollars for those things, but if you can find a buyer. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's a good way to check out some of these things if it is something that interests you. Well, let's go on and, and take a look at the rest of what goes on here. Verse 21, they've just said it's taken 46 years to build this temple. I believe 46 years ago, the sanctuary was built. You're going to raise it in three days. Verse 21, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. In other words, he can see into our very souls. And you cannot con Jesus. It's just that way. The fact is, he is the living God come to earth, and you're not going to fool him. And so Jesus was not, uh, he was not wooed and won over by those who professed a little bit of loyalty and amazement. He knew the truth because he is the truth. And uh, so at this Passover, as he is carrying out many signs and wonders, people believe in him and they will continue in the months that follow. And it's there that we're gonna tie things up this evening by just taking a look at the festivals that are mentioned in the Gospel of John. John, more than any of the other New Testament evangelists, concentrates on these great festivals of the Lord, the, the feasts of the Lord that were celebrated by the Jewish people. And, and he specifically mentions at least six, some say seven, there are some who maintain that in John chapter 1, we have another one of those festivals that is taking place when John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But we know for sure that there are six of them mentioned at least. The first is here in chapter 2, the Passover. In chapter 5, it mentions a festival of the Jews. Some people have suggested that is Passover. Others have suggested it as tabernacles. We'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 5. In chapter 6, verse 4, another Passover is mentioned. In chapter 7, the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned. In chapter 10, the Feast of Dedication is mentioned. Now, that is a feast that is not mentioned in the Hebrew Scriptures, but it is a, a, a beloved Jewish festival. We know it as Hanukkah which I think is just really quite ironic because in the, the Hebrew scriptures, Hanukkah is never mentioned. It took place after the Hebrew scriptures were compiled, but it's in the New Testament. And uh, Hanukkah was celebrated in Jesus' day. It's still celebrated today. We'll talk more about it when we get there, but it was when the temple was purified after the revolt of the Maccabeans. And we'll go into that in far more detail when we get to the spot. And then finally, beginning in chapter 11, the end of chapter 11, we have the last Passover mentioned. And that is the, the Passover where Jesus offers himself up, is crucified, and rises from the grave. So in the Gospel of John, at least three Passovers, a mention of the Feast of Tabernacles at least once, and then a mention of Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication. Keep in mind, Passover occurs in the early spring, either in March or early April. Tabernacles occurs in the fall, usually in late September or October. Hanukkah in December. And uh, the one festival that is not mentioned here in the Gospel of John is what the, the Jewish people called Shavuot. Uh, the Feast of Weeks is another term used for it. We often use the term Pentecost. And Pentecost occurs generally in late May or in early June. And uh, that's, that's what we have. And John emphasizes this. The word that he uses is the Greek word heorte 
uh, the feasts or festivals. And what we are going to see as we look at these festivals is when Jesus teaches during those festivals, he very often refers to what are called the Haftarah readings. Among the Jewish people for centuries, they have always read the Torah from Genesis through Deuteronomy. They read through it once a year. They read through much of the prophets throughout the year, and they read through much of the writings throughout the year. When Jesus speaks during these festivals, he is often referring to the very readings that were normally used during those festivals. And what, <clears throat> what will become so dramatically evident is he will point those things to himself. And he's saying, in effect, I'm the, one who I'm the one who fulfills the Passover. I am the one who fulfills the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, it is dramatic. It is powerful. And once you see it, you can't let it go. Well, that's where we need to stop. Our time is up. It's also where we finished this morning. I'd like to close now with a word of prayer. And next time we meet, we are going to be looking at one of the most amazing conversations recorded anywhere in the Bible. A conversation that took place at night between Jesus and a leader of the Pharisees by the name of Nicodemus. It is an amazing conversation that has dramatic application for each and every one of us. So let's pray. Father, as we look at these words from John 2, there are so many things that stand out. Obviously, the identity of Jesus. He truly is the Messiah. He is also God in human flesh. And we thank you for all that he has done, Father. And Lord Jesus, we honor you as our Savior, the Messiah of Israel, the hope of the nations, and the living God. We also desire to follow in the footsteps of those who've gone before us. We want to heed Mary's instruction. Do whatever he tells you. Lord, may that be true of each and every one of us. May the Lord Jesus be the invited guest in our homes the honored guest, and may his presence in our lives utterly transform us from within. This we pray in his strong name. Amen.